nice to see so many of you come out for an event such as this. It's not every day that we have these types of occasions in our church and our families. I want to particularly acknowledge and be thankful for the presence of my brother priest, Father Stanley Exabit, pastor of Our Lady of Peace in Turner's Falls, and Father Bob Poonin, pastor of Our Lady of Grace in Hatfield. Thanks for being here, guys. In May of 2017, we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the apparitions of our Blessed Mother to three small children in Fatima, Portugal, Jacinta, Lucia, and Francisco. She appeared to them several times with a very powerful message, and we're blessed on this occasion to have the pilgrim statue of Our Lady be with us this evening. I want to thank the custodian of the statue for bringing her here today and being with us this evening. When she appeared to these three shepherd children, Our Lady gave them first a vision of hell, a place of utter suffering and torture and defiance. She spoke of wars and persecutions and famine. She spoke enough about evil things that would be enough to scare some small children. In all of this, though, she spoke of the triumph of her Immaculate Heart through devotion to her Son and through worship of His Sacred Heart. That more and more souls could be brought to communion with her Son, Jesus, through penance and prayer. And she urged those children to do penance for those suffering souls. One can only imagine what it must have been like for those three children. How those visions must have been terrifying yet so peaceful and beautiful. Because how could you be terrified at such a serene and beautiful face? It seems to me that while the lady's appearance in Fatima took place so long ago, her message remains for us even in our own day. Her words have a lasting, effective and sense. And they give us a sense of urgency. Do we not in our own day still see per the persecution of Christians? Do we not still, still see the famines and wars and divisions among peoples and nations? And this is where I think her message ought to ring loudly in our ears in our own day. That it's now our turn, as it was for those three small children, to win back souls for God. We must fight, not with the weapons of war, but with the weapons of our faith, prayer, penance, and virtue. We, especially our country, are on the brink of a major presidential election. How does Our Lady's message fit into this situation in our own day? How does it have an effect on us in our own time? We who are still plagued by divisions, hatred, and racism in our own country, how does she have an effect on the way we vote, on how we treat each other? and how we carry ourselves in society in our day-to-day -day living. How can we then choose to bring God back into the fabric of our culture? Because I think that's what she really is aiming for. That she would not want us to choose the lesser of two evils, that she would not want us to choose evil at all, that she wishes that we would consecrate ourselves and our nation to the heart of Jesus Christ and to win it for Him. But I think this is what makes her message so urgent in our own day, so necessary in our own times. That Christ must again have victory in our lives, in our culture, in our everyday living. In a homily on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, 13th of May, 1982, Pope St. John Paul II addressed the gathered, those gathered for Mass in these words. If the church has accepted the message of Fatima, it is above all because that message contains a truth and a call whose basic content is the truth and the call of the gospel itself. Repent and believe in the gospel. These are the first words that the Messiah addressed to humanity. The message of Fatima is, in its basic nucleus, a call to a conversion and repentance as it is in the gospel. This call was uttered at the beginning of the 20th century, and it was thus addressed particularly to this present century. The Lady of the Message seems to have read with special insight the signs of the times, the signs of our time. The call to repentance is a motherly one, and at the same time it is strong and decisive. The love that rejoices in the truth is capable of being clear-cut and firm. The call to repentance is linked, as always, with a call to prayer, 
In harmony with the tradition of many centuries, the Lady of the Message indicates the rosary, which can be readily be defined as Mary's prayer, the prayer in which she feels particularly united with us. She herself prays with us. The rosary prayer embraces the problems of the church, of the see of St. Peter, the problems of the whole world. In it we also remember sinners, that they may be converted and saved, and the souls in purgatory. May we who have this blessed occasion to be visited by Our Lady, never neglect our duty to look to her for guidance for in her intercession for her love, that she may guide us to truth, repentance, prayer, almsgiving, virtue, penance, conversion. May we echo her faithful hymn of yes every day of our lives, following in the footsteps of her son, following in her footsteps, path that is unknown, uncertain, but yet trust in the loving embrace of the merciful heart of our Savior, that he in the end will have the victory over all our sufferings, that path that leads to the heart of her son, Jesus Christ, this path being one of conversion, repentance, prayer, a path that seeks inner conversion of our own souls, and by doing so, helps others find their way to God as well. Through her intercession we pray, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, touch our hearts and make them like your own. The world is in a mess, and so is our country. Ninety-nine years ago, Our Lady came to Fatima and told us how to avoid what we are now experiencing. And if we should not listen to her, how to turn things around. Sister Lucia said that Our Lady appeared to her many times when she was in the convent, always looking very sad. And one time she asked Our Lady, why are you always so sad? Our Lady said, because they are not listening to me. We're like the child stuck in the bathroom, crying, Mommy, I'm locked in, I can't get out, when the key is on the inside, and how frustrating it is to the mother to try to get us to listen to her and turn the key. Our Lady gave us the key. In 1916, during World War I, Pope Benedict XV asked all the children in Europe to go to Holy Communion and offer it up for peace. Our Lady sent the angel of peace from heaven to the three children at Fatima, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta, and he gave them Holy Communion. Jacinta and Francisco received their first Holy Communion from an angel. He told them he was the angel of peace. And he told them that in order to bring peace, we must fulfill our responsibility to convert sinners. Chiefly by praying for them every day and by making sacrifices to repair the damage done by their sin. To make sacrifices of reparation for their sins. The angel gave us a prayer to say every day. Oh my God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. And he asked everyone to say at least once every single day in fulfillment of our mission of spreading God's mercy all over the world to renew the face of the earth. Remember, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, have courage, I've, con I've overcome the world. He didn't then say, sit down and I will convert the world. He said, go forth. He sent us to convert the world. Not just the priests and the bishops and the religious, Everybody, all baptized Christians, Second Vatican Council taught that very precisely. Every one of us 
has a mission to bring souls to heaven. So Sister Lucia asked the angel, how do we make sacrifices of reparation? He said, first and foremost, he said, offer everything up. First and foremost, most important, stop complaining about your daily crosses. Accept them and offer them up to the Most High as reparation for the sins which are offending him. Jesus said, take up your cross every day and follow me. Every day. The cross is every frustration, every irritation, every difficulty, every ache and pain, everything that goes wrong during the day. It's our cross. We all know we have guardian angels. Why doesn't the guardian angel prevent us from suffering? Because Jesus suffered. You know, we have a tendency when we're suffering, especially if we're suffering a lot, to say, why me? What have I done? What did Jesus do? Nothing. We are united to him through baptism. Even more through Holy Communion. Strengthened. So that we receive from him the power to fulfill our mission of converting others by praying for their conversion and by doing their penance for them. Pope St. John Paul II said that. He said the message of Fatima is more important today than ever. And he wrote after he was shot and suffered a lot from his wounds. He wrote a meditation on the Christian meaning of suffering. And he said that when God came to earth and suffered, he transformed suffering itself so that those united to him through baptism could offer their suffering for others. He said, if we have a loved one who's not living a good life, it isn't enough to pray for them. We need to do their penance for them. We get to go to confession and then do our penance given to us by the confessor. But if somebody is living a bad life, they're not going to confession, or they're not making good confession. Somebody else has to do their penance for them. And this is God's plan, that the children of Adam and Eve would restore the order that they destroyed. But it's impossible for us to do it alone, so God became man, transformed suffering and death, and then instituted baptism to unite us to him in such a way that his suffering is channeled through us. So he said, take up your cross every day and follow me. And St. Paul says, I make up in my body what's lacking in the suffering of Christ. He didn't mean that Jesus was too weak. What he meant was that Jesus is channeling his suffering through us so that we will share in the mission of undoing the damage done by Adam and Eve, our first parents. Very fitting. God every day, always does everything in a fitting way. He didn't just ignore original sin and forgive us anyway. He became man and paid the price, which we couldn't pay. He didn't then go out and convert the world himself. He put that on our shoulders. Helps us. He travels with us. He gives us the powers. But he expects us to use it. Our Lady warned us that if we don't listen, everything will get worse. Suffering and turmoil and war will just increase if we fail to fulfill our responsibility to convert sinners. Because the war and trouble is caused by those who don't love God and their neighbor. Our job is to bring down God's mercy upon them. <laughs> in order that they will change, love God and their neighbor, and then they will stop doing bad things. And that will bring us the measure of peace that is possible in a fallen world wounded by original sin, which is a whole lot better than what we're suffering right now, which is man-made suffering. We have to get rid of that. And we haven't been listening to her. Well, the next year, Sister Lucia said from that point on, they hadn't yet started making sacrifices. They just paid attention. 
everything that went wrong during the day, everything they didn't like, they accepted it and offered it up as a cross, united to the cross of Jesus. The next year, the war was still going on. Pope Benedict, on May 5th, wrote a letter to the church saying he was inserting the petition, Queen of Peace, pray for us, into the litany of Laredo. And he was asking the whole church to join with him, praying to the Queen of Peace for peace on earth. On the ninth day, May 13th, Our Lady came down from heaven and appeared in the cove of peace in fact. She was answering the prayers of the Pope united to the whole church for her help. Sister Lucia said the most important request of Our Lady was the very first thing she said. Are you offering up your suffering as reparation for the conversion of sinners? The very first thing. And that's the thing that we're only now beginning to wake up to the importance of. Which is why millions and millions of rosaries pray in response to Our Lady's request for rosaries. Undoubtedly saved us from much suffering, but didn't make things better. Things have continued to go downhill over the last 99 years. Because a rosary is the prayer part. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins and save us from the fires of hell. Our Lady made it very clear we cannot ignore the, the penance, the reparation part. And the Angel of Peace explained it. The most important thing we can do, we can make sacrifices, and that's important. The Saint Therese of the Zero, the little flower, explained why the most important sacrifices we can ever make is the sacrifice of our will by accepting the suffering that God allows us to go through. For heaven's sake, God could prevent it. Why doesn't he? Because he didn't prevent the suffering that Jesus went through. Even when Jesus asked him that the cup might pass him by, but not my will but thine be done, we become Jesus, his mystical body through baptism. And therefore, we are expected to participate in the passion down until the end of the world in order to bring God's mercy on the world. Could have done it otherwise. He wants to bring his mercy through the children of Adam and Eve, working with Jesus and the power that he gives us. So we will have the credit of having restored the world, which is much better than if he did it without us. He could have done it otherwise. That's how he chose to do it. And so Second Vatican Council speaks about this, the, the mission and responsibility of each baptized Christian to participate in the spiritual warfare. We forget, we were born into a spiritual battlefield against the devil and his angels. And we're baptized into that battle to participate. We're all soldiers in that battle, to participate. Simplest thing everybody can do, the least everybody can do. Pray for sinners. Stop complaining about the things that go wrong during the day. Sister Lucia said we need a radical conversion in the way we look at suffering. We have to recognize what it's for. If we're in the state of grace, it's for converting others. It's for imitating Jesus, carrying our cross, so that his power is channeled through us. Because he doesn't want to do it by himself. He wants us with him in the battle. Our Lady said to tell everyone, when you offer your suffering, offer it for love of Jesus, for the conversion of sinners, and as reparation for sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And she promised that if enough Catholics would listen to her and do what she asked, many would be converted and there would be peace. And she warned that if we didn't listen to her, Suffering and war and turmoil would increase throughout the world, which is what happened. So, the children said nobody believes us. We're just little children. Our Lady said, tell everyone to come in October, and at noon on the 13th, 
God will work a miracle to prove that this is true. And that's important because if we're going to take heart and be motivated to do this, we have to first believe that this is real. So our lady said, God will prove it. The newspapers made fun of the children and of the people who believe the children. They said, there is no God. There's not going to be a miracle. What are people going to do at the end of the day when nothing happens? 70,000 people came to Fatima, and a bunch of newspaper reporters from different papers were there to record what the crowds would do with their disappointment at the end of the day. News story. But the miracle happened. What the miracle was, was a vision of the end of the world. That point had been largely missed. It looked like the sun was plunging down to burn up the earth. The newspaper reporters fell on their knees, screaming to God for forgiveness. Thousands of people were screaming out their sins in public, begging God to forgive them because they thought it was the last judgment. And God gave us another wonderful grace. Some of the people interviewed after the miracle of the sun, said they were filled with joy and excitement about going to heaven. Because they believed in heaven, it was real to them. They wanted to go, and they were living good lives. So God was showing us that if we have that attitude, we can expect to get special grace on our death not to be afraid. I had a great grace to experience that with both my parents. My mom passed away in 2004. My dad last summer, a year ago. And they both went with great joy right up to the end. My dad took him six weeks from when they thought he was dying until he finally died. And he was just looking forward every day to his last breath so he could get to heaven. Let everything else go. His life was over. He lived a good life, raised eight kids, some 40 grandkids. Time for him to move on, and he couldn't wait to move on. So proving to us that what God was showing us at Fatima, the miracle of the sun, is still operative. <laughs> Pray for the grace to believe in heaven and to want to go there and to live worthy of going there. And then don't worry. God will give us the grace. But what are we going to do to save our country? In 2005, Pope Benedict, following the will of Pope John Paul II, elevated the Blue Army to official status as the world apostle of the Fatima, the official arm of the Catholic Church to spread the message of Fatima all over the world. Our job is to motivate the laity. It's under the Pontifical Council for the laity. Motivate the laity. Teach the laity what our lady asks. Motivate the laity to do it. So that we can bring down God's mercy more effectively, more quickly, more powerfully upon the world. We're 99% of the church. We need a church needs our power. And so, in the United States, we've got a beautiful shrine down in uh, Washington, New Jersey, if you ever get a chance to go down there, absolutely beautiful shrine to Our Lady of Fatima, the best Fatima shrine of Our Lady in the country. And we made a prayer card with a picture of our beautiful statue on it, and on the back, the prayer the angel gave us to say, my God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, do not love you, and the offering our lady asks us to make. Like Jesus, I accept and bear with submission. Whatever crosses God permits in my life today, for love of you, for the conversion of sinners, and in reparation to sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. This is not asking God to send us more suffering. This is offering him the suffering we're going to go through anyway. Anyway. Don't waste it. 
doing more suffering or asking God to send more, that's a matter of God's grace touching our hearts. What we're asked to do is not waste the suffering that we go through, that our guardian angel doesn't protect us from, because he's required to allow us to have a cross every day, or we couldn't carry it, as Jesus asked. It's caused by original sin. It's allowed by God so we can participate, it's a privilege to participate in the passion of Christ. So, if you don't know the story of Fatima, we have a table out here with the book written by Sister Lucia. They were just short visits, it doesn't take long to read it. Get it and read the story, and then pass it on. Don't put it away. Tell the person you give it to, not to put it away, to pass it on. Keep it going. Circulate the books around the parish. Restore to your parish the memory of what happened in Fatima. And then tell people about, you <coughs> see it in what our lady said, the need to offer our prayer and our daily suffering. And these two little prayers make it very simple. And it only takes about nine seconds to say the two prayers. When your eyes pop open in the morning, before you even get out of bed, make a sign of the cross, say the two prayers, start your day. And then try when bad things happen to remember to offer them up. At the end of the day, try to think through if there were any bad things that you forgot about, complain about, offer them up then. Our suffering is powerful. Let us start using it and restore to our country through God's grace respect for the Christian faith. We have our lady's promise if we would just do what she asks. So we have down here next to our lady and in your pews, more toward the front, a pledge to our lady, if you wish to make it, that you will do your best to remember to say the prayers every day and to offer your suffering when it comes. Just that you will do your best. And we have 65,000 American Catholics that are now doing this, that have made the pledge to our lady. Make sure a member of the Holy Father's World Apostle in Fatima, engaged in the spiritual warfare using our babies to convert our country and the world. You only need one pledge per family. So you can put Mr. and Mrs. down on it. If you have additional family members, you can just put the number of additional family members. I've got the prayer cards in my pocket when you come down to venerate our lady. You can give me the the pledge and tell me how many prayer cards you need for your family. I'll give you one for each family member who needs it. And together we'll increase our number to 100,000, to 500,000, to a million, and we will see God's grace active in our country when we do this. Thank you very much. God bless you. You are welcome when you venerate Our Lady. You bring down religious articles, rosaries, and so forth. We follow the custom that we brought from Fatima of touching things to her mantle and asking her to bestow the special graces of the shrine in Fatima on all who use these items that have been touched to her mantle. And even the Bishop of Fatima said, even those who just venerate this image will receive, he begged our lady to bring all the graces of Fatima to those whenever they venerate this image to receive the same graces they would get if they were venerating her image in Fatima. Thank you very much. God bless you. name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. This month, we're celebrating an historic event. We're studying and celebrating a great miracle, a miracle that science has been unable to explain, but a great miracle that God has given us to make a point. Here's what happened, 1917. 1917 in Portugal, in an out-of-the-way village by the name of Fatima, Fatima, Portugal, three children have had an unusual experience. For the past few months, they have been having a series of visions and apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the Blessed Mother coming down from heaven, invisible to everyone but those three children, has given them a message for the world, a message that can affect our future, that has, in fact, affected our history 
that we are living right now. These three children, illiterate, uneducated, living in this out-of-the-way place with no knowledge of what's going on, are experiencing an amazing event. They are told in these visions that at the end, the last vision, there will be a great miracle. Now, here's what's happening. Over the month, over the last few months, when the Blessed Mother has been appearing, more and more people are coming. They want to see something. They want a sign. They want a miracle. And they hear that the last day, there will be a miracle, a great miracle. Now, there are a number of problems that exist. First of all, Portugal at this time is anti-Catholic. It's communist. It's anti-clerical. And they, the government is upset with the fact that people are gathering for a religious event in such great numbers. They try to eliminate it. They try to stop it. There's nothing they can do. The people keep coming. And then they realize that on the last day, the day of this supposed miracle, something's going to happen. The people will be enraged. They will riot. There will be a disaster. So they have a problem on their hands. They don't know what to do. Here's what happens. On this last day in October, 1917, the 13th of October, it's been raining. It's been torrentially raining for a week. And yet, people are coming. People are coming by the thousands to this field, to this little valley field. And they've been filling it. Day and night, they've been coming. Almost 70,000 people arrive in this field, drenching wet, in mud up to their ankles, but yet they come. Many of them are sick. Many of them are in wheelchairs and on litters. They're carried in. They want to be part of this miracle. The government is very upset, and the local government sends the militia to surround this valley, complete with guns and bayonets, because they're concerned a riot may break out. The newspapers, which are anti-Catholic and uh, anti-clerical, come in their fancy automobiles, and they park on the edge of the field at the top of the hill so they can see everything from the comfort of their car in the rain. The people keep coming. And on that day, at 12 noon, the children come. The crowd parts for them. They kneel in the mud. And the children say, let us kneel and pray the rosary. And so all these thousands of people, except for the communists on the top of the hill and the uh, anti-Catholic newspaper reporters and the soldiers, everyone kneels in the mud. Remember, it's been raining for several days. The people are soaked. They've been camping out at night with no protection. They kneel. They begin the rosary. Then at exactly noon, the children look up, and they see the vision, and they point to it. Everyone looks up. The sky suddenly parts as if a great curtain, and it's beautiful. The sky is suddenly blue. Almost in an instant, the rain stops, the clouds part, the sky is clear. The children are oblivious to all of this. They are focused on the Blessed Virgin Mary who's giving them a message, and they listen intently. But the people, the people don't see this. They simply see that the sky has cleared, and it's suddenly a beautiful sunny day. But then something strange happens. The sun appears to begin to spin. It's like being inside of a great stained glass window or a kaleidoscope, and colors seem to bounce off of the valley's edges, on the trees, on the people, on the clothing that they're wearing, on the sky. And it's like being in a psychedelic uh, uh, kaleidoscope. They're confused, but they're watching this in amazement. The photographer 
from the newspaper takes pictures of the people standing there with their mouths agape watching this event. First everything is yellow, then green, then purple, then red, then white. It's an amazing event. The people up in the cars get out of their cars to see what is happening. They've never seen anything like this. 70,000 people are seeing this. Strangely enough, people as far as 25 miles away are seeing this also. They have no idea what's going on in Fatima. They hadn't heard about this miracle that's supposed to happen, but they also witness it 25 miles away, and they're curious, what in the world is happening? This kaleidoscope that we're suddenly enveloped in. And then, as they look in horror, the sun seems to stop and begins to plummet to the ground. It becomes bigger and bigger. It's coming. It's falling. The people are frightened. The people are in a panic. They begin to run. They throw themselves in the mud. They cover their heads. They try to protect themselves. The communists up on the hill dive under their cars. The newspaper reporters dive under their cars. The soldiers throw their guns down and run. A friend of mine, his grandmother, uh, out, uh, as I say, about 20 miles, 25 miles outside of Fatima, unaware of what was happening, coming back from the market, threw her groceries on the ground that she was carrying and threw herself under a bush as if that would have protected her from the sun falling to the earth. The people, as I say, are in a panic. They're shouting out their confessions. They're begging for mercy. They're praying for help. And suddenly, everything is normal. Suddenly, the sun is in its place. Suddenly, there's nothing. There's simply a clear and beautiful day. But the people notice something. First, they're perfectly dry. Their clothes that had been drenched from being out in the rain for several days, camping out, perfectly dry. The ground is no longer muddy. It's perfectly dry. The paralyzed person over there in the litter is standing up. The blind man over there suddenly sees. The, the sick have been healed. The communists crawling out from under their car with their mouths agape. The newspaper reporters writing down exactly what they see. This astounding miracle. And the strange thing is that scientists today say that for all of that to have happened, that is, for the clothing that was drenched from the mud uh, five, six inches deep, for all of that to have been dried in an instant would have required an amazing degree of heat to the point where the clothing would have burst into flames, the people would have been scorched and burnt. But that didn't happen. Strangely, everything was dried. So it was a, an astounding miracle, a miracle that people saw this strange event with the sun, this solar event, their clothing drying in an instant, the ground drying, and the crippled, the deaf, the blind, the sick healed in an instant. The communist newspaper wrote and described this event. And it was kind of an amazing thing to pick up the newspaper the next day. A communist newspaper, an anti-clerical newspaper, the headlines said simply, Miracle. In big headlines, big letters, miracle. And they reported exactly what had happened. Of course, they got a call very angry from Lisbon. What are you doing? Why are you proclaiming a miracle? Why are you supporting the church? The editor simply said, we reported exactly what we saw. We didn't make anything up. It's what we saw. It was a miracle. It cannot be explained. And that's exactly what happened 100 years ago this month in Fatima, Portugal. Now, you have to ask yourself a question. Why would God permit such an event? Well, you have to ask yourself, why does God allow miracles? And what really are miracles? 
Well, first of all, a miracle is something that is beyond scientific explanation. They cannot be explained. They should not happen. For instance, a blind person suddenly being able to see. That should not happen. There should be some physical intervention, but there isn't. That blind person can see. That's a miracle. This solar event should not have happened. There's no explanation for it. It should not have happened. A miracle. So why does God allow this? And more, why does God allow a miracle there, but not there? A miracle there, but not here. Why? What is the purpose of a miracle? Well, first of all, God allows miracles for no other reason than to remind us that he exists. A miracle is sort of like a nudge, kind of uh, poking us to say, I'm here, I exist, and here you have proof of my presence in your world. I am here, and I do this not only to cure that person, not only to uh, have that happen, not only for this event, I do this to remind you that I love you. That's one sign of a miracle, one reason for a miracle. But there's another. Oftentimes, God will allow these miracles to make us aware of a particular message that he wants to give us. Now, at Fatima, Our Lady presented a message for the world. It wasn't a message for a few people, for a community, or for a group. It was for the world. And so the miracle had to be outstanding to attract the attention. 70,000 people witnessed it. It had to be something spectacular. There was a message that was meant for the world. And so that miracle was kind of like a uh, certificate of proof. I exist, and here is my message. What was the message at Fatima? Well, there's a rather involved message, but here's something else to be aware of. Our Lady gave certain prophecies at Fatima. Now, here's something that's interesting. We are talking about the historical miracle of the sun, the solar event, the healing, the uh, immediate drying of the, the clothing and so on. That was there. But Our Lady also promised and prophesied. And that's something that you and I have witnessed. We have seen a miracle also. Let me explain. Our Lady at Fatima promised that if her request for prayer, penance, and conversion were not met, that the Russians would infect the world with their error, that the Russians would enslave nations. Now remember, this happened in 1917. Think of this. 1917, the Russian Tsar was shot. His family was murdered. World War I was in progress, and Russia was on the losing end. They weren't doing well. The the revolution had taken place. Russia was in complete chaos. The thought that Russia would have such influence and power so as to enslave nations and to inflict its error on the world was not a possibility. It was not something that could possibly have happened. Those looking at history in that day and age would have simply uh, ignored that message. And here's another thing. The children, the children were illiterate. They had no knowledge of history, and they had very little knowledge of what was going on in the world at that time. And in fact, they remarked that they thought when the Blessed Mother spoke of Russia spreading her error, they thought she was referring to an old woman, that Russia was an old lady. And so they didn't know what she was talking about. But at any rate, here's the thing. Russia does enslave nations. Russia does make nations disappear, as it were. And so Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, 
the Ukraine, Belarus, all of those countries and more no longer exist or are enslaved. You and I have lived through that, the Iron Curtain, etc. We have lived through that. The Blessed Mother prophesied that if her request for conversion and prayer and penance were not met, a greater war would enter the world than was being inflicted on the world at that present time, World War I. So she prophesied World War II, a greater war than the one they were experiencing then. All of that happened. World War II came about, nations were enslaved, the Iron Curtain, nations did not exist, they were uh, made part of Russia and so on. Communism spread throughout the world, throughout Europe, to Asia, and even into South America, Cuba, etc. The error was spreading. But the Blessed Mother said, if you pray the rosary, if you do penance, if you convert, if you change and come to my son, those nations will be freed. Russia will be converted. There will be changes, and they will be for the good. Now, you and I have experienced that miracle, the fulfillment of prophecy. Do you remember when Russia suddenly, suddenly, overnight, was no longer communist? I remember seeing that in the paper and thinking, how can this be? Not a shot was fired. There was no revolution. Suddenly, communism ceases to exist. Russia is no longer a communist power. Poland is free, something that we prayed for as children in our Polish church, that Poland would be free again. Poland is free. Czechoslovakia, Hungary, These countries are free, and suddenly countries that never existed in our lifetime, Estonia, Latvia, the Ukraine, Belarus, and others, are suddenly back on the map. They had not existed. They were freed without a shot being fired. Our Lady predicted that, and you and I have lived through that event. That's an amazing thing to consider. Now we have to consider what does... Our Lady tell us that we have to do. What changes do we have to make? Well, one of the interesting changes or one of the interesting requests she makes is for modesty. Modesty. She says that fashions will offend our Lord. Certain fashions will offend our Lord. And I remember at one point when I was much younger reading that, and I thought, in 1917... Most people dressed very, very completely. Most women wouldn't even show their ankles, let alone anything else. Their dresses came up to their necks. Men would be wearing a a jacket because it was considered improper for a man to expose his shirt sleeves, let alone anything else. And yet Our Lady is saying at that point that certain fashions will be offensive to God. And of course we see that today because certain fashions certainly can be and certainly must be offensive to God because they are so provocative. That's one thing that she talks about. She also talks about the fact that if we pray the rosary daily, we will make a change. How can that make a change? The rosary is only a prayer, but it's a unique prayer. The rosary is a unique prayer. It is a series of prayers and meditations. When we pray the rosary, we meditate and put ourselves in the presence of God. We meditate on the very life of Jesus Christ and Mary. And so we unite ourselves spiritually with Jesus during the prayers of the rosary. So if we learn to say the rosary properly, we will affect a change on ourselves, and in changing ourselves, we will then be able to change others. So Our Lady is asking for prayer prayer and penance and conversion. If we do the rosary, if we learn the rosary, if we pray the rosary, we will affect that change in ourselves, and then we will be able to affect a change in the world. And so uh, this is one of the requests of Our Lady. So we're asked to be modest in our appearance so that we do not cause others to sin. We are asked to pray the rosary daily so that we can be 
completely united with God and one with God. We are asked to um, affect a conversion on our life that it is more in union with God's way. And in doing all of that, she says that we will have a period of great peace, a period of great peace. Well, that hasn't happened yet, but we haven't been fulfilling all of the requirements. But remember this, Our Lady promised a number of things, and she has already fulfilled them. We are waiting now for the fulfillment of that period of peace. And that will only be affected when we begin to fulfill her request more so. And so, the miracle was a great reminder, a nudge. God exists. God loves us. And he has given us a message through his mother to change the world. We can do that. And with the rosary, we can affect that. With Mary's help, we can affect that. This beautiful image right here, by the way, is a representation as the children saw the Blessed Mother in that vision. They saw her completely dressed in white. They saw her standing over a shrub, a, a kind of a, what they called a home oak uh, tree, a little tree, and uh, they saw her enveloped in light. When she came, she was, as it were, in a ball of light. They saw her, they heard her. In those visions, by the way, they also saw something very unusual. At one point, the people, as they were watching the children, saw the children scream and pull back. The Blessed Mother gave them a terrifying vision at that moment. What do you think it was? It was a vision of hell. They saw the actual existence of hell. And they said they saw the souls dropping into hell like snowflakes in a blizzard. Can you imagine that? So many people going to eternal condemnation. Here's an interesting fact. Saint John Bosco had a vision also, and he saw a vision of a beautiful pathway slowly descending, roses and flowers on either side. The highway was very wide, and he noticed that at the very end, there was a great abyss. And then he noticed people coming down the hill on this highway, but they were running. They were running. He tried to stop them, to hold them back, but they would not be held back. They would run into that abyss. And the point of that vision was that no one pushes us into condemnation. We go freely. In fact, Jesus tells us that we go with complete freedom. It is our choice. St. John Bosco in that vision saw that people were running with great anticipation, almost with great joy, to cast themselves into that abyss and that fiery pit. That's a scary thought. Well, think about it for a moment. When we sin, we could stop. When we do something evil, we could stop. By the way, what is sin? Sin is the absence of love. Anything we do that is not loving is sinful. If I lie, if I gossip, if I uh, hurt someone physically or, 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 or mentally, if I do anything that is harmful to myself or to others, that's, uh, that is unloving, that is sin. But you will find that sin is addictive. And we repeat and repeat and repeat. We could stop, but it's our choice, and we have to make that choice. So, they saw this vision of hell, but they are given the remedy. Unite yourself with Jesus Christ. St. John Bosco saw that vision also. Unite yourself with Jesus Christ, and with him, all things are possible. In Christ, we have strength, and we can do all things, and we can break any addiction, we can change our way of life, and we can unite ourselves with God. And with God, 
we will have peace, we will have happiness, we will have joy. And that is the promise. Many people simply have never bothered to try. So, Our Lady is telling us, please, come to me, and I will lead you to Jesus. And Jesus will give us his peace because he loves us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.